I'm uh, Christos Karos, I'm the Executive Director of the Onassis Cultural Center in Athens, and the Onassis Cultural Center is a proud partner in the Sounds Now, um, uh, in the Sounds Now project. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be here for this uh, panel and to have a wonderful group of people uh, to be talking with. Um, in alphabetical order, Sandeep Bhagwati, who I won't introduce again because we just had the pleasure of an amazing keynote from him. He won't be actually making a presentation on the panel, but as soon as the other three uh, panelists have made their uh, contributions, I'll ask him uh, to, to make his own contribution as well. Uh, George Lewis, who was a professor of American music at Columbia University, is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a correspondent, a corresponding fellow, sorry, of the British Academy, a MacArthur Fellow and a Guggenheim Fellow. George Lewis's compositions have been performed by ensembles worldwide, and he holds honorary doctorates from the University of Edinburgh, New College of Florida, and Harvard University. And it's been a great pleasure to work with him many times in Athens as well. Elaine Michener, born and raised in East London of Jamaican heritage, is a contemporary vocalist, movement artist, and composer. She's a founder of collective electroacoustic trio, The Rolling Calf. Her sound works are held in curated collection by George E. Lewis at Darmstadt Festival, and also featured at Holland and Rot Triennale festivals. Her works, such as Sweet Tooth and The Then Plus The Now Equals Now Time, seek to confront us with the history and persistence of colonial power. Anotai Nitibon from Bangkok in Thailand is an educator, composer, and curator who bases her musical research on the idea of the intercultural dialogues between cultures through works of compositions, performances, sound installations, and exhibitions. She is chair of the postgraduate program at the Princess Kalyani Vadhana Institute of Music in Bangkok, Thailand, where she has also hosted an annual international symposium and ASEAN Youth Ensemble project. So, um, welcome to everyone, to the panelists. Great to have you uh, here. It's such a tremendous pity that we can't be all together uh, in Berlin, uh, but thanks to the organizers for inviting us uh, nonetheless. I'd like to start with a few very basic and preliminary thoughts about what I understand uh, by decolonization and then get the discussion going with the presentations by the panelists. So in my mind, um, to my mind rather, decolonization is not the same thing as promoting diversity, equity or inclusion within an institution. The lack of diversity and inclusion is of course a result of colonial history and the continuation of coloniality but it would still be possible in theory to have a really diverse program and still not have addressed decolonization at all. Secondly, decolonial practice is not the same thing to my mind as bringing non-Western forms into the Euro-American art world or celebrating multiple modernities or alter modernities. These strategies, I think, in the eyes of decolonial theory, maintain the subject-object relationship, whereas decoloniality is creole and hybrid. Thirdly, decoloniality brings a more radical and horizontal critique of Euro-American modernity into play. I would say that it has three fundamental moments. First, spotlighting the organic relationship between the European Enlightenment and modernity on the one hand, and colonial power in the many ways it has been exercised since the conquest of the Americas on the other hand, and rectifying the contemporary distortions that this causes. Secondly, understanding the epistemic cons consequences of this coloniality, the eradication of knowledge forms and cultures, and the establishment of canons in theory, research, and art, that whilst having very specific sources in Europe claim universality and consequently making efforts to delink from and unlearn these canons. Thirdly, producing new creative work, again in theory, research and art, that emerges from a primarily local collective struggle to valorize alternative forms of knowledge and practice. Finally, um, decoloniality is not just a theory. It aspires to a new configuration of the lived world, a real tout monde, to quote uh, Glisson. Even if there remains, even if this probably will always remain a horizon, there being no point at which this work would be finished. But above all, there's a real need for actual restitution and reparation. And I would end on a phrase by the curator Yvette Mutumba, 
who says that real decolonization has to hurt. So uh, I'd like to give the floor first uh, to, to George Lewis. Um, George, um, the floor is yours, off you go. Well, thank you, Christoph. Uh, it's happy to see everybody. Well, I can't really see everybody, but in um, any event, thank you for inviting me to come and to be a part of this. Um, you know, I was reading the website, which says something very different from what Christoph said, and I think maybe it should have been there as well, because he had a lot of uh, helpful orientations uh, to this whole topic of decolonization. But I was actually re responding to the earlier, this, this sort of curating diversity business and this very hopeful narrative about uh, the need for keeping the discourse on diversity in contemporary music in Europe alive, which was surprising me because I thought, is it in danger of dying? Well, maybe it is. I mean, because really, I've also started to consider the possibility that diversity discourse, you know, it's reached, it's made a lot of progress, but it might have reached its peak. And I know a lot of people among us were just getting started with diversity. And now to have somebody come along and say that it might already be all over, you know, it's like, uh, it could be annoying, but you should hear me out. You should hear me out on this. I mean, I've been hearing about diversity for a really long time, you know, and uh, over the decades, just to give you an idea of the time frame, I have experienced a lot of skepticism around the term and how institutions deploy it. I'm thinking about Sarah Ahmed's wonderful book, uh, where she talks about implementations of diversity discourse by institutions. I've noticed this and also in my recent work, seem to tout diversity's gender face while hoping that no one really notices or cares about the absence of discussion of race and ethnicity. And that's particularly the case in Western Europe, where gender statistics are more readily available than other demographic vectors and often the refusal to log race and ethnicity outcomes that people seem to justify because it you know, promotes national unity or avoids those nasty identity politics. Um, but uh, as one scholar put it, the negation of these identities may be just a tactic for consolidating the position of dominant groups. And certainly in a decolonizing discursive environment, you have to consider these kinds of tactics and the way that governments and, uh, and other kinds of institutions use the ch what this, this scholar called the choice of ignorance to avoid uh, really coming to grips with some of the, um, avoid scrutiny for their actions. Um, because really taken historically, gender and ethnicity race, they go together. I think people started calling it gender race now. And under any colonizing regime, it's women who bear the brunt of this oppression, but the oppression is also experienced intersectionally that is with race. And, and so we have to think about that in the sense that progress on gender alone isn't really enough and we should be suspicious and really impatient with those who insist that we can do gender first and do race later. I mean, you know, Martin Luther King already wrote why we can't wait. So we should think about that at the very least. So now I want to get to decolonization a little bit. I only have a few minutes. In 2012, I collaborated with the Sound Art Collective Ultra Red on a very interesting project. We were considering this question, what is the sound of freedom? What is the sound of freedom? And I was reminded of this when I read an interesting interview in Outer National, this, uh, the website links to this, and it's a V Klink Colonialismus, you know, what's the sound of colonialism? And I read a lot of cool stuff there, but I feel like we already know what colonialism sounds like. I mean, we hear it at a lot of contemporary music festivals already. But the composers and the improvisers aren't really the ones producing the sounds of colonialism. Rather, it's the music curators, I think, who have been composing and improvising colonialism. So what I think we should try to discover is what decolonization sounds like. I mean, how could music curators start composing and improvising decolonization? What would a decolonized curatorial regime sound like? Now, we sort of know already, in a sense, what it would look like. If you think about uh, Document 11 in 2002, where uh, the Nigerian uh, curator, Okwian Wazer, became the first non-white curator of the festival. Now, there, surely there's no reason 
why contemporary music festivals and other important institutions that support it couldn't do the same, and why don't they do it? You know, just say that straight up. And I suggested the model of creolization as a way toward creating the sound of, creole, of decolonization. Of course, I really chose this metaphor because it specifically references race in the multinational. A creolized contemporary music culture is going to be, is not going to be race debt. It's going to be race aware. So what I ultimately expect is that like colonialism, we will be able to hear decolonization, the everyday life of sounds heard at festivals large and small. And so maybe we can rename diversity, just simply rename it as new music decolonization. So for the rest of my brief period here, I want to talk about eight difficult steps. New music, de music decolonization, eight difficult steps. I was going to, not eight easy steps. At first it was going to be in 10 easy years. And then I thought, well, people are very impatient, so I don't want to do that. Who knows how long it could take, but it's not going to be tomorrow, I can tell you that. Okay, step number one, move beyond kinship. Um, Sarah Ahmed writes, an institutional logic can be understood as a kinship logic a way of being related, staying related. Institutional whiteness is about the reproduction of likeness. Institutions are kinship technologies, a way of reproducing social relations. So you get that in music too. I mean, genre, kinship, usually co-present. It's even predicted by the root, you know, G-E-N, gen, genetic, genotype, you know, even gender. I mean, genre markers like improvised music, classical, psychonosis, and so weiter, you know, those are also about the reproduction of likeness. You know, and they end up being like the Procrustean bed, you know, the thing where if it's, you know, it's like the rack. If it's too small, you stretch you out, and if you're too big, they crush you. And so that's the, it's, especially for artists of color, that is the effect of, of genre in many cases. And as these kinship technologies, these kinship discourses become adopted as natural, by institutions, by festivals, by academic programs, by foundations, they really act as obstacles to change. So that's number one, give up on kinship. Number two, give up on meritocracy and invest in new populations. You know, some granting organization festivals, I mean, I'm in the U.S. for a few more days before I pop over to Berlin, but right now I'm noticing that some have achieved greater gender and racial diversity than others. I'm thinking MacArthur, Alpert, uh, Herb Alpert, why wouldn't he be the first? Uh, United States artists, etc. Others, including some of the most prestigious, and they know who they are, have never, for example, never awarded, given award to or programmed the work of a black composer. Although in the wake of the George Floyd murder, they felt obliged to offer pro forma expressions of solidarity. Here's a sample. We stand with our black colleagues, friends, audiences, artists, and all those who've experienced the vicious history of racism in this country. And we are asking how we can support those voices by giving them a platform through the art we create. This very prominent organization has never commissioned a black composer. So what we used to hear is that these kinds of decisions about commissions and you know, positions and all that. They are based on merit, but there's really no such thing as the best composer. So the impact of a lot of years of fake meritocracy, decades of curatorial commissioning and academic employment and admissions decisions proceeding from what bell hooks called white supremacist capitalist patriarchy amounts to a kind of investment. You have to think of it in terms of an investment, an investment in a certain sector of the society and a complementary disinvestment in other segments of the population. This resulting disinvestment, the results of it appear early on in the very low number of women and people of color that I find in applications for graduate school, grants, academic employment, and as well as poor outcomes in terms of the programming that we see. Um, so that means that what has been called white privilege, a phenomenon that's by no means limited to the United States, becomes a form of unearned equity that crosses gender lines intersectionally. The tragedy is that a lot of really brilliant people, male, female, non-binary, who benefit from this regime are really also trapped in it with everyone else in a system of bad faith. So what happens is the system itself exploits those differences in our outcome to try to divide and conquer uh, the cultural population as a whole. 
So that's number two. Give up on meritocracy, invest in new populations. Number three, uh, diversify school music programs. It seems to me it's odd to me that curatorial discussions never discuss the pipelines. Yeah, I'm sitting at a big fat university in New York City. I see what the pipeline is. There are all these people, they've all graduated from this and that institution and they've gone to this and that master class and all that. And, you know, so, and the applications are almost 100% white, and, um, and maybe there are like 15% women in the pool, and so on and so forth. So that, that is the result of a process that starts way before they get to us. So why can't curators go in and look at that and partner with some of these people early on? For example, you could identify and recruit young composers and performers from non-majoritarian backgrounds and institute early composition programs. This happens a lot in the U.S. Young, I mean, we're talking young, I'm talking about 10, 10 years old, 11 years old. They get to write pieces for the New York Philharmonic or something. I mean, these kinds of things, okay? That could happen here. Maybe it already does. Maybe I don't know. I guess I'm going to find out. Maybe you can tell me. Private and public music programs up to the university level should have publicly articulated plans for increasing de new music decolonization and they have outcome reporting. It's not just a matter, well, we're doing our best, we have a nice website, but what have you actually done? How have you documented this? Okay, number four. Is that how you do, how you do four in, um, in, uh, in German? I, don't know. I think I know that uh, three, it's not this, but it's this, right? Okay. I learned that on uh, Quentin Tarantino. Well, actually, I knew it before. But anyway, um, <laughs> you know, in Glorious Bastards. Number four, encourage ensembles to commission and program in diverse ways, including specific calls for composers of color. That's pretty routine here now. You know, I'm getting constant calls for diversification, specifically along those lines. And some people see that as a form of the hated quotas. But I'm reminded of an oblique story there. You know, I asked... I thought I was being discriminated against, so I asked my mother, and I said, look, you know, they have Mother's Day, they have Father's Day, why don't they have Children's Day? And she said, guess what? Every day is Children's Day. So rather than being a victim of discrimination, I was actually taking for granted being a beneficiary of all of that daily attention. So in fact, uh, it's this, to actually call for these kinds of specific things are a means of actually doing decolonization. Okay, number five, I don't know if that's happening, maybe it is already. Make diversity a part of cultural policy. You know, U.S., we don't really have a cultural policy, but in a lot of European countries they do. And so I'm wondering what responses, I read this in a German, mag in a German magazine, what responses have the European cultural sectors made to the Black Lives Matter movement? You know, I saw a huge demonstration a couple weeks ago supporting that. What's been the response of cultural organizations here? Have there been any public plans? Have there been any institutions? Muhal Richard Abrams, my mentor and the co-founder of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, he once said something very important. He said, we know that there are different types of black life, and therefore we know that there are different kinds of black music, because black music comes forth from black life. Well, similarly, decolonized music will emerge from decolonized life, but curators will have to start living these decolonized lives, which new gender-race relationships will produce new sounds. And a failure to hear these sounds, it's basically not only a form of sensory deprivation, but also it's a form of addiction. It's an addiction to exclusion as identity. And you know what happens when you get addicted to stuff? You, you, you become poorer and maybe it kills you. And so that's what happens, will happen to the field if these addictions are allowed to run rampant as they have been doing. Okay, I only have a couple more. Internationalized music curation decisions. Many curatorial decisions, particularly at the most prestigious festivals, are international. They're not local to one country. They're, they're like documenta. So there's no reason why major institutions should that tout themselves as international should continue to present these all-white programs. So we need to have curators from non-majoritarian ethnicities and genders and regions, and of course, what non-majoritarian is depends on where you are, but nonetheless, we're talking about an international pool. Uh, should be, I've been talking a lot about the absence of Afro-diasporic uh, composers on major festivals, but, and histories and so on, but that's not the only uh, exclusion by any means. So it also is not gonna be enough to limit 
composers and artists of color to low infrastructure commissions while reserving the important commissions for white people. Um, you, you know, so you have to watch the infrastructure too. When you're talking about decolonization, actually decolonization itself is a kind of infrastructure, but it depends on other infrastructures to work. Okay, so number seven, encourage media discussions of new music decolonization. You know, find ways to talk about it. Radio, television, newspapers, magazine. I mean, in 1980, the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik actually published an article on diversity in the United States music scene. I mean, I'm just wondering, have they published anything about that, about what's happening here? I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is 1980, man. Okay, the last one, change of consciousness. This is where I'm going to end up. I've already suggested that the mental envelope of creolization allows contemporary music to move beyond its Eurocentric conception of musical identity toward becoming a true world music. And by Eurocentric, I don't mean Eurological as the website states. I know the term Eurological. I made it up in 1996 in an article. So for me, the term, the Eurological could become a part of a project of decolonization. The Eurocentric, never. Simplistic, hegemonic, closed, and as my article stated at the time, ethnically essentialist. So what the new music field really needs right now is a mosaic identity that recognizes historical, geographical, and cultural cross-connections, not to achieve diversity, but to achieve, and you, you music people like this, to achieve a new complexity that promises far greater creative depth. Some of the children of color being born right now, right there in Berlin, right here in the U.S., will be writing a new sonic chapter in the history of the region and the world, one that recognizes with the philosopher Arnold I. Davidson the true promise of new music decolonization, that multiplication of perspectives means multiplication of possibilities. Okay, so what keeps us from realizing that promise? And I'm just going to say all that stuff we talked about, but also a blockage of consciousness. Without the consciousness, you don't get the rest. And I fear that diversity discourse has led us to a prosthetics of inclusion. You know, like a clunky metal knee replacement. I know about that because I have one. Um, instead, what we need to do is to invent, well, it's not that clunky, actually. I thought the guy did a brilliant job. But, you know, there are the clunky ones. Uh, but what we need to do is, right now, we need to invent a new we. And I saw this on the website, too. I said, wow, what, who is this we we're talking about? We need a new we that understands contemporary music, not as a globalized, pan-European, white, sonic diaspora, but more, you know, maybe more like the blues. Everybody plays it all around the world. And if this new we can embrace our future, even with all the turbulence it entails, if we can place ourselves conceptually in that situation of a Creole, we can reaffirm a new kind of common humanity in the pursuit of new music decolonization. Was that too long, Christos? That was just right, George. <laughs> Are you sure? Anyway, it's over regardless. <laughs> yes, okay. That's, that's, that's great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, they're condensed to the point as, as always. I propose that we hear from all the panelists and take the questions at the end so we have a better uh, management of the, of, the, of the discussion and, and yeah, a better exchange. So I'd like to ask Elaine uh, to take the virtual floor. Elaine, over to you. Hello. Hello, everyone. How to follow George, um, because you have eruditely and eloquently covered lots of the things that I've been thinking about but couldn't express as well as you have done. So um, I'm, I'm having to modify what I thought I was going to <laughs> address, um, but it's all connected. And I was thinking about box ticking and tokenism and other dangerously lazy programming ideas, which as someone who has been on both sides of the desk um, as a promoter of composers of contemporary new music in the past and also now the uh, for me happier side of the desk as a performer I've seen firsthand and experienced firsthand all of these things um, which I understand why they have happened but it doesn't make me very happy and I think at this point in time that we we need to interrogate and to call to account curators and professional artistic uh, directors about how they are making decisions 
on the kind of exclusive uh, programming that they're, that they're presenting in the 21st century and why they are reticent, reluctant or afraid to be representative in the kind of music that they want to share with the general public. And that public, I'm thinking, who is the public that listens to contemporary new music? Well, they mostly do not look like me, but they would consider themselves to be completely liberal um, and opening and, and, and welcoming. But actually, you scratch the surface and perhaps not so much, because if you start to introduce other music, and I'm thinking about what George was saying towards the end of, of, his, of, of, of his talk, about making it more universal in terms of what does contemporary music mean? What does it sound like? It is a new music. It is not steeped in the past, in the past canon of what Western, white, Western classical contemporary music. And it can, there is a platform for these new expressions, but it takes, it will take uh, brave curators, honest curators to go ahead and program this works. And if you do this out of a real love for the music, and a curiosity for a newness and an integrity, then you won't suffer from box ticking or tokenism or other dangerously lazy programming ideas. And as a provocation, I'm thinking about removing, resting that uh, the power that curators have to create, to cu curate um, programs and handing that to the artists. And then I thought, well, not all artists want change as well. They want to stick with the music that they are famed and known for. But there are artists out there who are connected to a new new music. And they then have the power to advocate for that music and discuss and argue and have it programmed in festivals. Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, kind of put myself forward, but I'm just thinking about a project that I was that I was asked to put together. Well, not a project. I was invited to present a piece at a, a, a major German festival, which hopefully will happen in a few weeks' time at Donaueschingen. And I was invited to present a work, and I wanted I didn't want to create something of my own. But what I wanted to do was to present a a program of work which I felt represented contemporary new music in the 21st century. And that in my mind was representative. So because of that, we have, we will, I've been working with pieces written by composers from the African diaspora, as well as European Western traditions. But they are looking at the writings and the ideas behind Sylvia Winter, who was a Jamaican cultural theorist and feminist. And so it's about being human. And I listened into the last discussion before we, we opened with, with this symposium. And um, I don't know the name of the, of the composer from Switzerland, but he talked about curators being human. And I completely understand that. If you are not engaging with society, if you're, not, if you're closed from what is going on around you, you can't possibly, you cannot possibly program work that is relevant. And what I mean by relevancy is that it is, it is connected Elaine, we've lost you, unfortunately. Let's let's see what we can, if we can do anything. Not much. Elaine, can you hear us? Can you write something in the chat if you can hear us? Okay. Right. Well, what we'll do then, maybe Elaine, you need to reconnect. Good. So while we're waiting for Elaine to reconnect, um, Anotai, could I ask you to step in um, and rather, let's see, just see if she's going to reconnect immediately. Uh, let's give it a, just 15 or 20 seconds to see if she's going to get back straight away or if her problem is more um, 
more long lasting. Okay, right. So, um, Anatai, maybe we open up a room, well, not a room, we put a pause on Elaine's talk uh, for a while. You do your presentation since you are online, and then we'll ask Elaine uh, to catch up again with her, her train of thought afterwards. So, off you go, Anatai. Sure, thank you. So, can you hear me okay uh, from your side? Okay, wonderful. So, um, might be because I'm on the opposite side of the of the earth with you guys in some way and um, um the context that i'm facing in in bangkok uh might be a little bit different from what you are experiencing in europe or in the united states uh, but somehow i i really um love what professor lewis mentioned that maybe there's certain things that education can help and whether I also witness um, many times the festival in Europe when I attend that there's always this kind of consistency of being as you say like um, white male well educated and the one who really kind of like make decisions for all of us what kind of new music we should be hearing so maybe uh, this time I if I can show a little bit of the presentation because I guess uh, the context of what we have here in Bangkok might be a bit different so if I can share my screen just a little bit so what I'm proposing today might be a little bit uh, provoking from my side. Um, um, my, I'm myself and my name is Anotani Dibon and I'm a as uh, working in the Conservatory of Music in Bangkok. And I'm also hosting the, the International Symposium in our schools. And in some way, the ideas of how we hosting the International Symposium is not really going together with the goal of the school at the beginning. Why? Uh, because in 2013, uh, the government of Thailand decided that they want to create, recreate a new Conservatory of Music uh, in the like of the Paris Conservatoire 200 years ago. And this is what they wanted. And these are the realities that we have around the schools. So in some way, this is kind of really a good place to, to start this kind of thing. So is the idea of colonizations, where does it begin? Sometimes even when the era is over and people still think that this, this is the value that they are looking uh, that they're after, then what can we do? So um, again, again, this is the kind of like the musical context that we have in Thailand. Uh, we have kind of like very limited number, only certain group of classes of people who are actually listening to classical music and traditional music, jazz, and of course, all these kind of like contemporary uh, local music that we have, uh, that we call Luk Tung. So it's kind of like house music, those kind of things. So the next part, the, so maybe um, you might know that Thailand was in some way weren't colonized during the time uh, in the uh, 18th and the 19th century, but I wouldn't say that we weren't like completely uncolonized. Um, so, but, but from, uh, so I grew up in Thailand, not knowing about this um, idea very much. Um, I learned about history of the country around, but really this concept was not really understood as a shy. Um, so we weren't, we thought we weren't affected by this. So when whenever we heard of the word um, colonizations, we always think of maybe it is the ideas of like that some certain certain uh, certain countries are taking over, uh, reaping benefits and all this kind of thing in the country around. And we can see a lot of um, sad story of the country around us. But looking back at history a little bit, um, when we talk about colonization, then you see this video, and especially if you see it in a very really big span of time, you know that at one point, uh, Thailand was a conqueror of another country. We are actually taking out resources from the country around us. At, at one point, maybe just a few hundred years later, then another country also taking over. So the idea of um, can we ever finish being 
decolonize or not, and especially of um, these current days and in this region where we are really abundant of resources of food and everything. So I think and people are very easygoing. So we look quite looking quite delicious for any superpower in the world at the moment. So we really kind of wonder whether this era of decolonization can we ever finish one before the next one started or not. So, and of course, um, we, we have a really long traditions of Hinduism um, coming from India. But what interesting is that um, these are the kind of the core traditions we have in Thailand. But because of uh, that we weren't colonized, um, this root is still here with us. And somehow the idea of social classes and, and the idea of the um, leader of the country as a deity is still uh, very much um, in the core of our country. So this that's also another discussion. So just kind of give you a little ideas about this, um, about uh, where Thailand was at, the, at that time. And you might know that this is kind of like the, the person, um, in, in Thailand we have these traditions that the person who bring in cultures from other cultures or the say people who are curated our history were well, the one who are in power. So maybe let me bring in, in these uh, ideas a little bit that the person in power is the one who sort of like working as a curator um, to the culture in our own country. So, and this is the red guy, you might be familiar with him in these pictures more. See, so the king and I, of course, this is King Rama the fourth. He is at that time already sensed that there are certain threats uh, happening around Thailand. And what he did, I think, um, let's see past all those kind of like historical um, mistakes and all those kind of thing. But just to see this picture a little bit, he was thinking of educating his young sons of all these changes in the region. He himself, you can see from this picture, so these are the pictures in the throne hall. Um, he promoted the ideas of um, uh, different religions. He promoted the idea of science. He himself um, calculated uh, the eclipse to the precise minutes. Um, so it means that at that time, they already adopt the idea of science, um, which is in some way against the belief of Hinduism that really take a deep root in Thailand. So he was lucky because his son to his step, um, there was one thing that he mentioned to his son just before um, kind of um, at the time that they were deciding what to do with all these superpower. He mentioned that um, it's impossible for Thailand, even when we, we dug up all the goals, we won't be able to fight all these superpowers because if we buy weapons from them, when uh, they start fighting with us and they stop uh, giving us uh, weapons, then we already lose a war without starting one. And the only thing that we can fight these kind of thing is the true hearts, true words, and wisdom. So that's that's why he was trying to get people to educate. And you can see in his son, he's, um, so this is when um, already kind of like uh, the ideas of decentralizing the government, uh, he actually finished the ideas of um, slavery without bloodshed. And, but at that time, uh, around us is already um, starting all this kind of era. And he made this visit to Europe, befriend the stars and this is possibly because of making connection, making friends, knowing knowing even the enemy in order to um, uh, understand or take a bit of a better position, better understanding of his own country. His son, the next one, he went to study in Oxford, came back, bring back a lot of Shakespeare's um, theater and translated it into Thai, uh, sometimes with uh, mockery, sometimes with new interpretation. But this is the way of introducing um, different cultures to Thai people. The next one, even though he brought in the ideas of orchestra, he hired a German uh, musicians to came, uh, who came, teach music and conducted the orchestra, uh, created uh, the radio station, but at the same time, he still practices his um, Thai musical instrument and compose Thai traditional music along the way. And of course, this is the one that uh, our former kings, uh, who just 
um, formally passed away in the last few years. Um, at that time, he brought in the idea of jazz music into Thailand. And one thing that I really like about his idea is that instead of just only uh, performing the music that has already existed, he wrote songs. He's a songwriter. He wrote 40 songs, more than 40 songs. And these are the music that actually in some way very cleverly bounded people of Thailand together. And this is one of the things that I really like uh, is that he always go and perform for university students in the thousands. So this is the way of kind of like uh, engaging public into music making. Even though it's a new thing, he, uh, he created ballet, uh, him and his wife, also with uh, the guest choreographer, made a ballet based on that story from Thailand, but using all these kind of ideas from the West. And you can see just this a little bit. So this is kind of like uh, these kind of changes, not only kind of uh, st uh, stuck in the palace, but it is also happened around uh, the city. And this is one of the ensemble. You can have a look a little bit. <laughs> You might notice uh, the gentleman who played clarinet, that was Benny Goodman. So in some way, he's not just only adopting all these kind of um, music or new ideas coming in, but he's also constantly making exchanges. And you can see that the, the guy who played the flute, the pan flute, he kind of sort of like feeling a little bit challenged by the new, uh, the new culture that's coming in. And he wants to kind of like compete musically in a friendly way. So. This continued to happen, and I think uh, what I can learn from these people who are in power, but at the same time are working almost like a little bit of like a curated uh, cultures that coming into Thailand, this still continue. You can see nowadays that um, uh, the older people are teaching, uh, in working together with the young people, creating all this kind of music. You can see the, um, the older generation learning about technology in their own way and try to work with the new generation using their um, no, their knowledge and learning new things all the time. We have in some case, like um, one of our main teachers here, Bruce Gaston, he's actually an American. So in some way, he took the ideas of being an outsider, come in and questions a lot of things about um, uh, Thai musical traditions. And then from those questions, from those challenges, then he grew um, a big group of uh, lecturers of um, who actually really prominent Thai musicians that are now changing the history of Thai music nowadays. So in some way, having the outsider is also very helpful. And of course, when you have people in power uh, presenting certain music into the world, into the society, it's always the challenging side. We still have some people who felt that only certain kind of music, certain kind of values, if you want to be a good musician, you have to go and perform your music varying. It, it, it's, still, it's still very much the value uh, of some, some certain places. And these are still a challenge that we have to go and we have to keep negotiating in the future. So what I then what can we do as um, in my case as an educator and and also a curator. So what we did this this coming from the the program that we have in our institute now. So it's the Asian Youth Ensemble. So what we did is that exactly we invite young musicians to come, uh, commission them to write pieces, allow them to actually exchange ideas, making mistakes. And I have to say sometimes some of the piece is impossible that uh, as a curator we we like everything that people kind of like share and especially. Um, we have to be quite patient that these kind of things take times and a lot of mistakes. We should encourage people to make a lot of mistakes so that they can learn. And we just had one discussion uh, between Korea, uh, the Philippines and Thailand and today. And one of the Filipino uh, musicians mentioned that she was so scared when she uh, um, pr uh, produced her piece in Bangkok. Because, I mean, if she had done something like this in the Philippines, uh, it wouldn't work at all because her teacher wouldn't like it. But it happens uh, that in Bangkok, she met with the Filipino friends. And that's possible. So sometimes um, you have to allow this kind of 
uh, young people that they might not be sure of it. They wanted to try a little bit, and then so maybe you create a safe space for people to to meet and share. And you have to also, I mean, in our case, we also have to challenge uh, the authority a little bit of their understandings of self imposed um, colonizations. They wanted to the orchestra. What can we do with the orchestra? So these are the kind of negotiation that even as a curator, and especially as a curator, we have to negotiate a lot. Sometimes people will kind of like really disagree with you, but sometimes you have the audience on your side. The other things that we always do is that we always engage uh, people in the community in uh, any kind of works that we do. We already kind of like in our own, uh, in our program, at the university, we actually asked the student to take music for society as part of their accredited uh, study. They have to work, it's it, uh, kind of like, it's a rule that they have to work with the people in the uh, community. And you can see one remark that I'd like to make here is that we had one chance, we have to perform one of the graphic scores in our symposium. And it's impossible for me to convince any of my voice students to do it. but. Uh, surprisingly, the senior choir took it up voluntarily and they really enjoy it. So sometimes it's uh, because they don't have any preconceptions of what um, contemporary music means. And if I had the preconception that they wouldn't be able to sing, then we won't have that concert at all. So as a curator, I took um, uh, a little faith on the audience and believe that they can, they will give me a new perspective of new music even and we had a really wonderful concert and everybody remembered it so uh this is still i think is still an ongoing things uh what can we hope for as um educator as a curator we have to keep learning we have to keep uh challenging ourselves of uh things that we don't like uh keep asking ourselves whether is the um things that we are doing is already the correct things or not. And as you said um, earlier, that it, um, collaborating between people of different ideas is really helpful. And I started in the recent years to invite my students um, to be a co-curator to for, for our symposium in PGYM. And the result was really interesting. Every time I, I felt that I really can learn a, a lot from them. And, and you can sometimes uh, you see how, um, what kind of things they actually wanted as their future uh, for the music environment that they wanted in the future. So I really encourage, it is a really wonderful things uh, to do that. And maybe it, I guess it's important to teach already the student at uh, at the very beginning of the undergraduate um, that there is these kind of concepts that they have to try. Uh, there's a lot of these kind of suppressions in music schools, you have, we have to say that, and, and a lot of ideas that what can be done and what uh, can't be done. So if we can help with this, all these kind of dilemma, uh, giving them a lot of chance to make mistakes and that might help. So um, do you think I have a, just maybe Two well, more minutes. Uh, on the time we're running a bit, we're running okay. a bit late. Okay. Yeah, um, that, so that's it. Then is that? I think if we're going to yeah. have time to to discuss a bit and take questions from sure. from the the audience and other panelists, maybe. Uh, okay. Maybe then I stop there. We can stop there, and we can obviously we'll Thank be discussing. Um, unfortunately, uh, ah, Elaine is with us. Where is she? There she is. <laughs> okay, Elaine. Um, please try and pick up where you are. You know, if we can, you know, we have to sort of get to the uh, to Sandeep and the Q and A in about five minutes or so. Of course, so yeah. I, what I what I'm trying to suggest is that we we go straight on to questions, and then I may be able to in answering if anyone has a question for me, I might be able to include some of the things that I I wanted to say before I was rudely interrupted by Virgin Media's rubbish broadband. <laughs> so I am sorry I missed out on Anna Tide's presentation, but I'm uh, glad to be uh, back. Virgin Media, but if you want to sort of wrap up with or wrap up or just say one or two things, go ahead and then we can take the questions then. Okay, my idea was that um, artist-led or artist collaborative collab uh, curation with, with festivals um, can only open up possibilities for a more diverse and programming and that's representative at all levels and is of relevance also to 
the kind of public that and society that we are presenting to and that we need to actually decolonize the kind of audiences that we want and that is opening up the process completely right thank thank you uh sandy are you there are you in the uh, is sandy there yes he is Okay, uh, Sandy, would you like to, to, to pick up on some of the points uh, uh, that the other panelists have made before we move on to some questions? Microphone? Where's the microphone? Here. Hello? Yeah. I would like to tell two stories that have to do with a lot of what people have said, and I'm very grateful for especially the eight points by George, which wrapped up uh, a lot of the issues that are really important. Um, I saw um, a few days ago, I saw a video by Kadar Atya, uh, an artist who had made an interview video about decolonization. And in it, uh, Benedict Savoy, who is also well known to Berliners, I think she's leading the discussion in, in many points uh, of uh, restitution and decolonization in museums. Uh, um, told the story of how at the Vienna Congress in 1815 um, there was this big discussion about the art that had been looted by Napoleon. I alluded to it in my keynote. And um, of course the French didn't want to, it was not Napoleon anymore, it was the French government now who owned these artworks um, that were in the Louvre and uh, the countries around Europe wanted to have them back. Germany and you know different German countries and England and so on, they all wanted, uh, Netherlands, they wanted their, their artworks back. Um, and the French didn't want to give them back, so there was a complicated discussion, and uh, some compensations were discussed and so on, and finally, there was this very clear statement by the other states that said, um, we need you to give them back, because only if you give them back, you will acknowledge that you're not an empire anymore. Um, and that is, I think also at the root of decolonization is, for me, this realization that the, the model of governing the world that has pervaded you know, international relations over the last 100 years or 200 years may be not valid anymore in the same sense, and that uh, the, symbolic, the, 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 the symbolic transfer of, of power to other um, to other actors, maybe be not enough, but it needs an actual power of, uh, an actual transfer of power, where uh, we we do we do accept in in certain situations that the people who decide and define things are not the same people that were deciding things before. So, in a sense, what George has said and what all have said, that there's a that that we need the decision-making itself, the education, the decision-making itself to be changing um, hands in many ways, not only symbolically and not only uh, metaphorically. Um, I like this, the, the quote that um, Raven had quoted, that um, decolonization is not a metaphor. It's a, it's a fact, it's giving back land. So um, that's the first story. And the second story I want to tell is inspired by Anotai's, uh, hi Anotai. <laughs> Uh, Anutai's um, uh, story. It's, it's about an ensemble that, that came into being in India when I was in, in Pune. Pune has a liberal arts university called Flame. Um, it's in the state of Maharashtra. And um, the university was built by two software billionaires who wanted to have a new school. And they uh, obviously it was a kind of... Uh, Master of Business Administration School, but they insisted that the school should have a liberal arts education and that everybody who, who actually did business would, should also study art, practical art making. So you always have to enroll in practical art making classes when you study there. And um, this was the first school in India that had a course on extra Indian music, on music outside of India, which because Indian music is not taught in, in universities and schools generally, so it was a novelty to have a course in that anyway in the university, and then, in addition, a course on extra Indian music. And I was asked uh, to teach the course on European music, which I found very funny, but um, 
so I, I taught that course. And there were always some people sitting in the back that were, who were older than the students. Um, and they, uh, they were, I didn't know who they were, but, but you know, they, they looked very interested. And, and at some point, it, I think it was a, a, one of the lectures about fluxes that I gave, uh, fluxes and the experimentalists and so on, uh, one of them came up after class and said, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a local musician, uh, traditional uh, or Hindustani musician, and why don't we do fluxes? Uh, wh why is that, that we, that we in our tradition don't do something like this, experimentalism, and could we try this, and could you stay a few days longer and you know, sit down with us and just try to make um, something? And that was the birthing moment of an ensemble that is still uh, working in, in Pune, uh, ensemble Sangeet Prayog, which means music of exploration, so experimental music. And um, in this ensemble, the, the, the interesting thing for me was that the idea of what is an experiment was uh, developed totally from within the Indian tradition. So the, the, the thoughts of what would be revolutionary were with reference to their own tradition, not to, you know, they didn't want to emulate John Cage or, or, you know, anyone else. They didn't want to have a Yoko Ono movement there or something like that. They wanted to be experimentalists from within their tradition. And they came up with interesting stuff. We, we recorded a little bit. And the thing is that when I play this to European curators or listeners, they think it's traditional Indian music because they, uh, the gulf is so far that that for them, the things that the Indian musicians don't want to publish, we have a CD that we cannot sell because the Indian musicians, if we start putting this out on the market, um, our careers will suffer because it will be seen as sacrilege to, to make this kind of things without tradition. So it's there, there's a, there's a physical object that cannot be sold but only given as a gift to trusted people. And, um, and so they feel that they're so far out that they're Careers are in danger, and here people feel that it's too traditional. We kind of show this to a Western audience. And that, in a sense, is one of the stories that, I, that, that for me also encapsulate this problem of not of diversity. That's not a problem of diversity. It's a problem of understanding different epistemologies in, uh, and being able to listen to different epistemologies in productive ways. And I think when we have the wherewithal and the means and the, the presentational means as curators to present such music in another context where people won't, so that people won't think it's traditional and won't just put it away as saying, okay, that's traditional music. Uh, we have a lot of that in our, you know, in our series in the yoga center and so on. Um, if, if that doesn't happen anymore, then we are, uh, then, then for me, it would be a major step in decolonization and there's no Western musician involved in, except me, who is going there mainly to sit there and get the money from somewhere and sit with them and listen to them and ask questions. And that's, that's all I do, basically, because I have no idea what they're doing in detail. I just ask questions and say, that works. Um, now it seems to work. Now you seem to understand each other. I don't know what they do. I just sense that there's something clicking here, and then we can go ahead. So that, these are the two stories I wanted to tell in response um, to introduce another mode of talking to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, do any of the other panelists want to respond to Sandeep's uh, stories? George, Lane, Anatai? Um, I recall, Sandeep, was that when you came to Columbia a couple of years ago? Was that some of the work that you presented? Yes, it was. That was extraordinary. I mean, to see that, to see the, what constitutes experimentalism is always local mm -hmm. and based on the, and rather, like you said, rather than emulate. And that's what you started to see in other groups, such as the AACM that I was involved with in Chicago, because you're dealing with the possibility of, you're experimenting with what's local. Or if you think wider about uh, social movements, like my example is always the great migration of African Americans, 
which I consider to be just as experimental as anything John Cage came up with. In fact, it meets John Cage's definition of it, an action the outcome of which is not foreseen. Imagine you getting up one day and saying, well, I, I really can't stand life in the South anymore. I have to get out. Where do I go? Well, I just start walking. And we don't know what we're going to find when we get there. We've got to get out of here. So that's a huge kind of experiment. It's also a decolonizing kind of experiment. So I resonated with that. Seeing that again reminded me of uh, what, what experimentalism was really about. Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask a question which connects with a question that's in the Q&A um, from the audience which has to do about you know, other fields of artistic activity. And I think uh, both George and the Sandip in his keynote uh, mentioned you know, uh, work that's been done in the visual arts uh, field. And I've often wondered, it's true, the visual arts world and the theater and dance world have been much more uh, active in addressing these issues than the music institution. I, I'd love to hear if anybody has any theories why the music world has been so recalcitrant in facing up uh, to, to issues like this. Does anybody have any, anything to, to, to answer to that? Well, I just talked, I always have an idea about this. <laughs> but, but maybe someone else, if, you know. Um, I'll, I'll pause it. And, uh, and I'll say, yes, I think, I think it's down to uh, fear. And also there is an issue about uh, money and wanting to, uh, a concern about the kind of audiences, whether or not um, there's this kind of preoccupation of having a completely sold out auditorium or space wherever the music's being presented. And it's a narrow and short mindedness of those who are programming really, the fact that they they're not daring. Um, and also there is this, uh, it's almost seen as a, a ball and chain in some ways in terms of this kind of holding on to the, uh, what is now for me regarded as standard repertoire of kind of late 20th century contemporary new music and this, but it can act as a ball and chain um, because they just want to keep repeating the same, the same old, the same old thing. And for me, that's not new music. And in terms in visual art, I've heard different things about contemporary dance, um, that it's not as open. In fact, I don't know if the dance world is that open. Really, I don't think it is. Um, I think there's also this uh, problem with, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, what constitutes contemporary new music? Should it reflect something that is more that has a strong cultural identity? So, if something, for example, if something has uh, references to reggae or dub music, and it's going to be performed at a major contemporary new music festival, will it? Can that piece stand up on an, just a normal? Uh, basically just in a normal concert or does it need to be sidelined to something that you know it's the cultural aspect of that festival or it's a late night event where we're doing this kind of fusion thing and that's the i think that's i think that is the problem because those who are programming and the, their minds aren't open enough and I, and experimentalism takes on many forms and and there are cultures that are performing in an experimental way in music musically experimental way but they're not thinking of it as contemporary new music they're just experiencing and playing music and presenting it so if we if western programmers western european programmers uh, are unable are unable to unable to to uh to embrace music in its entirety and then be imaginative enough to see, well, this could actually fit in a program that has, I know there's an issue of programming and balance, but that's the job. That's the job that you've signed up for. Find a way to make it fit. Find a way to present and to challenge, provoke, enlighten, educate. That's the job. That's what you need to do. And if you don't know how to do it, 
then bring someone else, get advice. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Um, we've talked about education quite a bit, and there's a question from the audience about education too. Um, and, you know, I think it's clear that we're living in a period of, unfortunately, of increased nativism, uh, as opposed to increased openness uh, to, you know, to the other, where we have most, many, many societies are closing in on very retrograde ideas of uh, very limited and exclusive identities. So the question is, how could a uh, um, how could an educational process and how can curators and musicians um, help create a kind of uh, creolized musical pedagogy? Is the question working from the ground up? Um, in, any ideas, Anatai? Um. I guess there's two kind of problem. I think one is the um, pedagogical approaches that is done by the lecturer, and the other side is the uh, um, the institution, the ideas of what institutions of music is supposed to be. And I remember in another pa panelist in Singapore, uh, the directors of one leading research music institute in Europe, he said, if you want to fix this problem, it's very easy. Just take out a lot of funding from all these music institutions and they will wake up immediately. They will know immediately uh, of how to fix this kind of like, how to pr produce a new generation of musicians who are aware of this kind of thing. So that's the institutional side that is a problem. But I think in terms of pedag uh, pedagogical, uh, one call, this leads to the previous questions as well. Um, if you go to all these kind of local musicians, local music, um, they work a lot already with all these interdisciplinary, they have to work with dancers, or sometimes they also uh, can do other art form as well. And because why? And they have really close uh, link to the society. They know the story of the society because they have to take those story into making their own art. But if you're looking at the Western classical or contemporary music, there are too many layers. You have um, musicians, you have uh, conductors, you have the manager, you have the curator. So be before the musician can uh, can feel these effects of not relating to society, then then it's too far and they won't feel it. So I guess the only way that you can wake up people in the uh, in the education world is that get them to go outside, meet a lot of audience, speak to normal people, realize that musician is also citizen of this of the world, and that should solve a lot of problem. I think. Right, thank you. Thank you, Anatai. We have very few minutes left. So what I'd like to do is take a question uh, that uh, uh, DJ Modern from the audience has posed. And I'd like to ask you all to respond in one minute uh, to this question, or one minute, uh, which is, is classical music redeemable? Uh, so we'll take it in the order of the speakers. George. classical music redeemable wow is this like the what is the lightning round is that they have that like right. a game yeah, yeah, yeah. like in game shows and stuff yeah exactly uh, this is it. and the <laughs> i guess for me the answer is is classical music capable of redeeming anybody mm -hmm. and i'd say the answer is certainly yes uh I often do this story for my uh, undergraduate students because they're not used to seeing someone like me giving a lecture on Schoenberg. So what I do is I do it like this. I say, look, it's a redemption narrative. I drank, I smoked, I fornicated, and then I heard, uh, you know, Opus 24 serenade, and I was saved. And it seems to me that's exactly what happened to me. In, uh, at, 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 at university, where suddenly I heard Alvin Berg, and I thought, this is the greatest stuff I've ever heard, and I have to hear more of this. I'm just a kid from the Chicago ghetto, and when they ha well, that was the term they used back then. And so I think that any music can redeem you if you're in the mood to be redeemed. That doesn't mean if, when you get redeemed, that doesn't mean you get the keys to the church right away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, Elaine. Uh, I think I'm with George, yes. And as someone who grew up on an, an estate in the East End of London, where uh, I come from a working class background, and I volunteered in my primary school, aged six. I didn't know what I was volunteering for, but it was an elderly lady who came in 
and taught the recorder. So it was a lottery. And I wish that it hadn't been a lottery. I wish that all children would have the possibility to learn music. I was one of the lucky ones. And the, the fact that I was learning to read these dots on these lines, I hadn't come across them before. This opened up a whole new world for me. And yes, it, it, it showed me the possibilities and expanded my mind. So yes, it can redeem um, people. But I, like George, I teach in uh, an institution where uh, the postgrads and undergrads are not used to coming across someone like me talking about experimental music. And for my postgrad composers, um, I, gave, I taught a seminar titled Music That Should Be Felt, Not Heard. And the question was, you need to feel the music and allow that to move you, not just hear it. And if we continue to feel what, feel that music, feel classical music, it will mean something to us. And we'll be able to present programs that are of complete relevancy to everyone. Thanks, thanks, Elaine. Anatai, a quick response. Short, I think music, any kind of music can be redeemed and music, each types of music can redeem each other and each musician and the audience and all these people, we should, we should learn how to um, allow, actually allow music to redeem us as well as the person who are professionals in music. But don't forget that sometimes you need to be redeemed by music as well. So, of course, yes. Great. Thank you. Sandeep? Yeah, I think the question asked if the music is redeemable. I don't know if the music is the problem at all. It's not the music that's the problem. It's the system that maintains it. And, um, and I think that needs to re-examine itself. The, I can, the, 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 the glass house needs to be repaired or opened or something. Um, uh, but the music itself is not the problem. The music can interact with each person on an individual level, and that will continue. We have, um, you know, we have music from centuries past that can redeem somebody today, and music from the future that can redeem somebody in the future. I don't think that's the problem. Right. Right. Okay. Well, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Um, a quick word about the, the, what's coming next. Uh, right now, there's for the people on site. There's a networking walk. Uh, which sounds much more fun than the online networking on Zoom that we're going to be involved with. <laughs> but anyway, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, and then at 6.15, there's the third panel, Archives and Transcultural Composition, Looted Music and Accessibility. So in the meantime, I'd like to really thank George, Elaine, Anotai, and Sandy. Uh, for having taken part in this panel. Uh, thanks to everyone for having listened and to um, everyone in Berlin for having uh, made this possible. So thanks a lot and see you later. Bye. Thank you very much.